In education debate at the moment, most of our concern is with funding, and that's correct. We should be very concerned with funding. But the roles of government and schools, the respective roles of government and schools in what might be described as the education polity, also need close attention. It's very ironic at the moment that the Federalist opposition to Gonski on the grounds that it's uh, one size fits all, um, makes a great deal of state government's so-called closeness to their schools. And it's a, a prominent theme in the most recent policy document, which was released uh, earlier this week or late last week by the, uh, the Badu government. And the irony is that the people who affirm their proximity to schools, to public schools, are actually walking away from them through increased devolution and autonomy. Um, and there's a phrase which comes to mind from Marx's so-called Grundrisse in which he talks about capitalism um, atomizing the population. And there's a sense in which our public school systems are being fragmented, atomized through this policy. And we, I think, uh, are at risk of overlooking this when we focus uh, on the, the funding system. There are real grave issues of quality and equity at the end of this tendency to push all responsibility onto schools in the name of, uh, as we'll see, local ad adaptation. What we need is a good political model of schooling if we're to make use of a good funding model. We're a long way from getting agreement on the funding model, but if we only have a funding model and no concept, no broad concept of a political model of schooling, we'll be in danger of losing whatever progress uh, that we might make through, through the funding uh, reform. Historically, we've tried to equalise educational opportunities by creating public systems. We only have to think of the acts from 1872 to, 19, to 1895 across the country, which did so much to get us started. Uh, they were not successful in many ways, but they got us started um, in ensuring that wherever you were in the country, you would have access to a school and that it was, would be aiming at um, uh, decent standards. In, in this state, there were nearly 3,000 um, schools in, uh, in uh, Victoria in the mid-1930s. A great many of them were uh, one-teacher schools, very expensive to run, but um, of, of a great uh, public service. That's on the opportunity side. But in the last few decades, we've been much more focused on outcomes, rather narrowly too. And that's where the obsession with devolution of government, devolution of responsibility has come. Oh, well, we, we need to get the outcomes, and so we need to devolve. We need to um, um, abolish the centralised systems which have uh, done so much to um, uh, dumb down our system, keep uh, standards low, impose a one-size-fits-all model. So we need, we need to devolve. Victoria has led the way in this initially through the Kennett government and then subsequently through su successive Labor uh, governments. It's now followed by Western Australia, as Carmen will tell us, with the Independent Public Schools Initiative, and now, more recently, the New South Wales and the Queensland governments are flirting uh, with this prospect, it may merely be a flirtation. The Gillard government has embraced uh, devolution of um, management as a key plank in its reform agenda and will push it hard through the Gonski process. We have to ask, well, why is it so important? Why is there so much insistence on devolution and is this the right way to go? The arguments in favour of it really come down to one essential principle, that if you devolve responsibility, you can ensure that schools adapt to local community. So it's adaptation to local community. On the face of it, this is a laudable objective. Who could object to schools being sensitive to the 
nature and needs of their local populations. It sounds absolutely defensible, the most plausible uh, commitment. But neither the federal nor the state government sees that public schools actually don't have access to all families in their local community. Only those that don't use non-government schools. This is a really important um, issue which we will only see clearly um, when we examine local divisions of labour between public and private. What happens is that choice policies rob local public schools of a broader pupil mix and that risks lower expectations, less peer support, diminished teacher morale and effectiveness. So ad adaptation to local community then takes on a different and distinct flavour. It's about adapting to the needs of the population who have been left behind by choice whence the risk of residualisation, which the Gonski report draws attention to. Devolution, to be effective, requires comprehensive access to local community, not partial and selective access. But policies of choice have undermined this. The second assumption behind devolution is that good social policies are in place to support the work of schools. Good employment, housing, transport, health, community services, that all local communities are equally, equally well served by these services and that the most vulnerable and disadvantaged families have access, timely access to these services. This is highly questionable, particularly in the outer suburbs as recent work, for example, by Dodson and Sipe, Unsettling Suburbia. Uh, have demonstrated. We do try to compensate for uh, the, the disadvantaged aspects of community through equity policies in education. But in fact, the equity budget in state, uh, a state budget is a really small component of total budget, about 53 million, and it's dispersed amongst 1,600 schools. Uh, sorry, half of 1,600 schools. So it's thinned out and it's very difficult. So on the one hand, devolution is meant to free schools to relate more positively and more effectively to their local community. But on the other hand, policies of choice restrict their access to the most influential and culturally advantaged families within that community while poor services um, add to the difficulties of the families who are available to the public school. One thing we know now after numerous uh, attempts to demonstrate the contrary is that devolution has not produced the gains as measured by standardised cognitive tests that were hoped. Even though Victoria is a leader nationally on that land, there has been really no discernible improvement over all the years of self-management. If we look from AIM, then, then on to NAPLAN. So we actually haven't got the runs on the board that we was promised through devolution. And, and I think that is cause for concern, and that's using the crudest, most limited measures of achievement. If we use something rather more telling, like exam results or access to university, the situation is much worse. A really interesting example um, is the statistics on university offer rates to, to young people from different um, school sectors that has been um, examined by the Centre for the Study of Higher Ed. There have been important improvements in the offer rates to at young people from all school sectors in the five year period to 2011. Um, the, uh, the offer rate rose in government school systems to 71%, which is where the private schools were five years previously. In the meantime, the private schools have risen to 85%. And if you add access to boutique TAFE courses, it's practically a sure thing that if you go to a private school and you put your hand up for a tertiary place, a university place, you're almost bound to get one. 
But in the meantime, the share of commencing students in higher education held by low SES kids has remained virtually unchanged. So the wrong population, the wrong sector has grown. I see the root of this failure not in devolution itself. I'm in favour of a lot of devolution. The failure to me is at a much deeper level and it concerns a weak concept of public education. And David Mann was talking about ideas mattering. Well, the idea of public education really matters. If you have a poor and impoverished idea of it, don't expect to have a brilliant uh, public education system. We need a concept which is beyond the mechanical one that currently rules, at least in this state and possibly nationally, which is a public education system is locally adaptive. Why do we want, why do we want to adapt to lo locality? We don't say to private schools, adapt to a locality. Our argument with them is, if we're parents, is transcend the locality. Don't get stuck in it. Don't reproduce its limitations. Transcend it. And, and here's the money to do it. So to me, we need a much fuller concept of public education that challenges local context in all the limitations that are experienced, and it's in many different contexts, indigenous, urban, rural, not to surrender to it. And to have a public education concept that insists upon universal standards of provision and participation, not relative standards, not this is all we expect you to do, based upon intake adjusted measures of performance. You are at benchmark, that's good. To me and to, to parents, it's a completely unacceptable view that you have purely relative standards of achievement. And we need um, universal standards of provision. How is it possible in the area in which we are physically located in the moment, in the north of Melbourne, for there to be schools that there to be high schools that don't teach chemistry, that don't teach mathematical methods, that don't teach biology, that don't teach economics. About seven in 28 schools don't teach economics. I can see some good reasons for not teaching the kind of economics that is taught, but global financial crisis, no opportunity at an examinable level to study economic ideas and institutions. Seven in 28 don't alone teach geography when we've had the state burnt out how many times and we don't study geography and how can we get away with this because there is no universal standard of provision it's what the local school can adapt to so i think that is really weak the wider concept has some key elements and all I want to do in the time remaining to me is to flag some of those. It has to be socially integrative. It can't be using a residual sample of the local population. It must be socially inclusive. That is, it must work for those children in particular who have high needs. It must be high performing, work well on a range of measures and for everyone. It should be rich in curriculum instead of narrow it should be adaptive in teaching terms, and it should be well-resourced and efficient. So to realise this concept, which is a bit of an ideal, we need to create arrangements which encourage schools to work together. We need federations of schools, and in which systems play a proactive and a balanced role. We need a new education polity. What form this takes should be on our agenda for debate. We have to debate this. We can't go on with the myths that are, and I don't mean to be too critical of Gonski, but there, there is this concept of partnership in Gonski, which is grotesque. There isn't any partnership. There is pronounced and, and injurious tension. So we need a different concept 
of the education polity. We need a different concept of what public education is. And if we don't reform this political model of schooling, we are not going to be able to enjoy the benefits of a reformed funding model. Thank you.